listening to Shai Onana, your source for music, mint, and tea. Wednesdays from 2 to 3 on WPFW 89.3 or online at WPFW.org. Good afternoon, this is Shewan Anna show and I'm your host Nadim Foti. I'll be subbing in for Zain Al Amin. Um, today our show will focus on the boycott, divestment, sanction movement and the current legislative efforts to make it illegal. For those of you who don't know, the boycott divestment sanction movement urges various forms of boycott against Israel, Israel, including boycotting of Israeli goods, dismantling of the Israeli apartheid wall, recognition of Palestinian rights, as well as right of return. We are joined here in the studio by Mrs. Allison Glick and Mr. Seth Morrison, who are active leaders of BDS um, through Jewish Voices for Peace, Jewish Voice for Peace, excuse me, and the Freedom to Boycott Maryland Coalition. Um, Alison Glick is the chairwoman of the Freedom to Boycott in Maryland, a coalition working to protect First Amendment rights in support of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement for justice in Palestine. She is also a member of Jewish Voices for Peace and has lived and worked in um, Pal Israel, Palestine, and Damascus, Syria as a human rights researcher, teacher, and writer. And Mr. Seth Morrison has held leadership posts in various local, regional, and national Jewish organizations starting in college as a youth leader in Young Judea. He is currently active in Jewish Voice for Peace, serving on the National Board of Directors, the D.C. Metro Chapter Steering Committee, and on the National Con Congressional Outreach Committee. And in 2011, Mr. Morrison resigned from the Washington, D.C. Board of the Jewish National Fund in protest over repeated evictions of Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem. He chaired the Washington, D.C. Metro chapter of J Street in 2013 before becoming an active member in the BDS movement. Thank you so much for you both being here with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Good. So I'd like to start um, by saying, could you first just give us a little bit more background about the BDS movement and what exactly it is that you're doing and um, why you feel like BDS BDS is an important component of the Palestinian movement. Sure. Thank you again for having us. Sure. Um, well, in terms of our support for BDS in our coalition, Freedom to Boycott in Maryland, um, we've, we're, we first of all, a coalition of organizations as well as individuals defending the First Amendment right of Marylanders to support the Palestinian uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And we think this is important, uh, first of all, because the Palestinian community in in Palestine, uh, a group, a large group of uh, civil society organizations called on the international com community to support BDS as a legitimate nonviolent tactic to regain their rights and to uh, protect their communities, um, their internationally recognized human rights. Um, and we feel that, especially as Americans who whose tax dollars go to supporting the Israeli occupation, it's very important that we say it's time for Americans to speak up um, on behalf of Palestinians and say that uh, we need to support their cause. Mr. Morrison, would you like to add anything? Well, uh, I think I would like to add that, uh, you know, there's a long history in politics of boycotts. Uh, you know, you go back to the American Revolution and George Washington gave a speech in the Virginia, it was then called the House of Burgresses, about boycotting Great Britain. And I think it's a kind of tactic that's needed because Israel has been so intransigent. You know, for years, the U.S. government has said that Israel should be ending the settlements and ending the occupation, and Israel thumbs its nose at us. And so we need the strength of this movement to bring change. Yes. So do you think, I mean, specifically talking about the legislative efforts recently against the BDS movement, now they're trying to propose anti-BDS legislation in Virginia, and I know that the Illinois governor earlier um, uh, last year proposed an anti-BDS bill. Why do you think that there is such a strong backlash against BDS? Do you think it's their fear that it 
it could actually work in dismantling the state of Israel? I think you hit it right on the nose. Uh, the, it's very clear that the organized American Jewish community, through APAC and through Community Relations Councils, has set out to demonize our movement and to work at the state level around the country to file these bills. Now, they vary by state exactly the approach, but I find it fascinating that none of them try to defend Israel. You know, you look at the bills, you look at their arguments, and they say BDS is wrong, BDS is anti-Israel, BDS is out to end the Jewish state. None of them say Israel is right or support Israel because it's doing a good thing. They know that Israel is violating international law, so their alternative to us is to demonize what we're doing. Um, I also think that you're right, the narrative has changed. Um, I've been involved in the movement for Palestinian rights for probably 35 years. And when I was in college or right after college, um, you couldn't talk about anything related to a Palestinian or the Palestinian movement in a positive light. Um, Palestinians were demonized as terrorists, as um, anti-Semitic, etc. But I think Israel's actions and um, the recognition across the globe uh, that they violate human rights and international law um, can't be hidden any longer. With each successive onslaught, for example, the 2014 assault on Gaza, we see really who is the victim and who is the aggressor. Um, and the narrative has changed. That's being recognized. And, and BDS um, has, in fact, won great victories, um, not just in the United States, but across the globe. So, um, you know, I think your listeners may be familiar with the saying, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they attack you, and then you win. And right now we're at the attack stage, but we're, uh, we're defending those rights. So I also wanted to touch on a little bit as well, um, kind of the different types of sentiments um, regarding BDS. So for instance, um, on the ground in Palestine, at least when, when I was present, I definitely felt like a lot of working class Palestinians um, felt that the boycott divestment sanction movement wasn't necessarily a viable option for them because what they were concerned with is providing food for their family and just, you know, the short term of making a daily living. So so if you're getting your products that are in your store from the from Israel, I mean, if you're able to feed your family, that's really your primary concern. So how can we get the working class people of Palestine involved in this movement in a way where maybe they don't feel like they're compromising their own well-being on a day-to-day -day basis? And is this movement a movement that is um, the responsibility of the international community and is one that can't take root in Palestine itself? Well, I think I would turn your question around a little bit. Okay. First of all, I think obviously the Palestinians who are living in the region are the, the victims to the greatest extent. And we, we would never expect them to make their lives harder or more difficult um, because you're right, they have to eat, they have to live. I think the BDS is the responsibility of people outside Israel and Palestine. And we're also the ones, frankly, who have the opportunity to influence it. Um, sadly, because the Palestinians don't have a vote and because they don't have any say, you know, even if they were not to buy Israeli products, it wouldn't make that big a difference. What makes a difference is when we persuade a company like Orange, an international cell phone company, to leave Israel, or a company like Veolia that helped build the Jerusalem Light Rail and to pull out of it. Those, it's our job. Second of all, I think what the Palestinians can do is what they are doing uh, there in the region is, is civil disobedience in their own way, peacefully. Obviously, I'm not in any way condoning violence, but, you know, what we learned in South Africa and from Gandhi in India and from Reverend Martin Luther King is that nonviolent civil disobedience is what it takes to bring change. 
Would you like to add anything on this um, I would just say that um, I was actually in Palestine during the first Intifada. And um, one of the things that I was really privileged to witness was a people taking history in their hands and, and resisting in the way that Seth just described. And part of that resistance included... Um, in di- schools that uh, Palestinians themselves set up because the Israelis had closed down the schools as a form of collection, collective punishment. People growing victory gardens um, and uh, producing uh, producing goods so they could feed their families. Now, granted, of course, the situation has only deteriorated since I was there, obviously. But there is agency in the Palestinian community, and the Palestinians have a very, very long and proud history of um, engaging in these types of uh, these forms of resistance. So I think to the extent that we as internationals can support them in their efforts to, to act on that agency, um, that's really our role as well. And so um, within the context of BDS and just talking about Palestinian activism more generally, having been a Palestinian activist in the university community, I think it's um, really important to touch on the fact that there's a lot of negative sentiment and backlash against Palestinian activists. Most recently at GW, George Washington University, they banned the Palestinian flag, although that was reversed, I believe, by by efforts of SJP and BDS. Correct. And um, also um, at American University, the SJP um, members were attacked with um, flyers that were calling them terrorists, the members of ISIS, and all these really ridiculous posters that were just exhibiting them as m- ter- as part of these like extremist Islamist groups. So why do you think that um, Palestine particularly takes is such a sensitive issue in that respect and why there's this taboo centered around even talking about Israel or even being able to you know say something negative i mean you have people who are shifting who may have been actively um in support of the of the israeli state at one point and now are moving towards um kind of being a little bit more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, but why do you think that there's such this um, negative sentiment, even when it's not even like a very radical statement that people are saying, we just want to recognize that there's an occupation, even just that basic level? Why Why do you think that is? I think there's really a, a confluence of forces. Um, you have, of course, in this country, a very powerful lobby, APAC, um, and associated organizations who um, have been very good historically at, at, at um, putting forth this narrative as Palestinian, of Palestinians as terrorists and as negative actors, so to speak. Um, you have uh, a Jewish community that um, has, in my opinion, been sold been sold this this myth of what Israel is. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. It's the a safe haven for Jews, which we need because of the Holocaust, etc. Um, and then more recently, you have the rise of Islamophobia in this country. So, um, and if you scratch the surface of some of the organizations that ha- have really been promoting this Islamophobic s- uh, sentiment in this country, you see that they have a lot of ties to um, the Israeli lobby, to the establishment Jewish organizations. So they're sort of uniting in this effort to push this narrative. Um, so I think that's that's what we see on campuses, for example, the examples that you gave, as well as many others. Um, uh, and there have been two very important studies that were produced uh, this year or late last year, one by Palestine Legal and also another one by uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, documenting the... Um, the efforts to squash free speech on campuses in the way that you describe. And uh, I, I think I would build on that by saying there's tremendous amount of stereotyping. You know, when you hear Donald Trump say, ban all Muslims from coming into the country, and you have other Republicans lining up to say similar things, you know, 
and you do have, you know, we know that ISIS is a terrorist group and doing terrible things. And so it's so easy for APAC to say, you know, Palestinians and, and ISIS and Iranians and, you know, and they're all the same and they're all out to hurt the Jews. And unfortunately, it makes it too easy. So I wanted to talk a little bit too specifically about um, Jewish Voice for Peace, if that's okay with you guys, because um, I think that um, I was reading a little bit about your two-state versus one-state solution, and I know this is a controversial thing within the organization, and I was reading through your statement, which um, says that we support any solution that is consistent with the full rights of both Palestinians and Israeli Jews, whether one binational state, two states, or some other solution. It is up to Israelis and Palestinians to reach a mutually agreed upon solution. However, we also believe it is our obligation to offer honest analysis about the Israeli settlement expansion and the current Israeli leadership's open resolve to block the creation of a Palestinian state. So when reading this, um, it seems that it's clear that there's a recognition of the Israeli crimes committed against Palestinians. But I wanted to ask you how, what is Jewish Voice for Peace role within the BDS movement? Can the BDS movement exist if there is not a call for a one state solution and an elimination of an Israeli state? Is that possible? And how would the organization attempt to, um, to bring in people who maybe aren't aligned with that vision? Well, um, I don't think it's controversial within the organization. Okay. Um, we have fully endorsed the Palestinian civil society call for BDS. And we work actively on the international level with Omar Barghouti and with the other leaders of the BDS movement. Second of all, when you read the Palestinian call, the Palestinian call does not specify a one-state solution. It could very clearly sets out objectives of freedom for all, end of the settlement, and, um, and right of return. But it doesn't say how to achieve it. You know, as a number of people have said, BDS is a tactic. It's not a strategy. The goal of BDS is to have open and fair negotiations with legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people. And I don't mean the PA, which was, you know, a whole other set of issues. And, you know, full international and UN involvement. And then when that happens, when the Palestinians can honestly negotiate, the Palestinians and the Israelis can decide. Now, it is true that many people within JVP and, and many others in the movement think that one state is the best. And, and that's fine. We fully respect that. We don't disagree with it, but we say empower the people to truly decide what works for them. So the boycott, just so I understand correctly, so BDS isn't necessarily aligning itself with a one-state or two-state solution? Correct. There, there okay. is an official document that is the call that's been signed by, I think, like 300 different you know, leading individuals and organizations that says that we must boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel until, you know, these things happen. And, you know, it, it's full and equal rights for all people. It's end to the settlements, and it's implementation of the right of return. Yeah, it's, it's really a call that's based in international law and international human rights. And in that sense, um, despite what uh, those opposed to it would like to portray it as, it's not really a radical call. It's a call for very basic rights, that land should not be stolen, that uh, people who were made refugees through no fault of their own be allowed to return to their homes and to their ancestral lands, and that um, walls and laws that, that tear communities apart um, be ceased. It's not a radical document. It's it's something that's based in values, rights um, that we all hold dear. And, and I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. um, you know what Israel wants us to believe. What this vast propaganda machine wants us to believe is that somehow they want to make the Jews who live in that region second class citizens. 
And there is absolutely nothing like that. I mean, I'm Jewish. I have friends. I have family living in the region. I don't want to see them become second-class citizens. And But what I want to see is everybody equal. And that's what that call says. It says that all the people who are living in that region have their human rights, their religious rights, their political rights, and they have to be treated the same. And that's all it says. So you don't think that the... Um that the boycotting of Israeli products and basically making the state of Israel itself less powerful economically. Because I feel like what people don't realize, too, is how strong the occupation is economically in yes. Palestine. And so um, if, if the BDS movement is successful, you don't think that that would result in the state of Israel being dismantled and then, then having to come up with a solution of what type of state does there need to be present? Well, I think there's going to have to be radical change. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer not to use the term dismantling Israel mm -hmm. because that frightens the heck out of those who are Israelis. You know, one of the things we have in that region is, and it depends on how you count and where you draw lines, but roughly half the people in that region are, are Jewish Israelis and roughly half are Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So a solution has to serve all of them equally. Of course. So I don't want to say I have to dismantle anything. Mm. What, what I prefer to say is there have to be radical changes in governance mm -hmm. that will treat everybody equally. And, you know, the last thing I want to do is give my APAC friends ammunition to say, see, they're out to destroy us, because they're not. And when I say dismantle, I'm talking of the, about the, you know, the racist structures right, of the state of Israel, not, yes. not you know, Israeli citizens living on the ground. Although I do believe um, Israeli citizens need to also play a part in recognizing the own role that they do play in occupation as well. Absolutely. But, oh. you know, one of the challenges, I think, you know, my whole career, other than doing all my Jewish activism, has been in uh, marketing and strategic planning for businesses. And finding the words that reach, in a positive way, the large group of people can be challenging. And unfortunately, people on both sides will tend to use sometimes a more extreme term without thinking about how the people that they're trying to persuade think about those terms. Mm. And so what role do you think particularly Jewish Americans can play um, in the BDS movement and more generally in um, addressing the injustices that are committed against the Palestinian people? Because in, in a way, I feel that Judaism in itself has been misrepresented as being associated with Zionism. So um, what do you think that the American Jewish population can really create a difference in the Palestinian activist world? Absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, that's why groups like Jewish Voice for Peace were formed. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of what's been done by our government and by the government of Israel is done in the name of Jews and of the Jewish state. So I think that uh, American Jews in particular really um, have to step up to the plate. We Jews in this country have a very long uh, tradition of social supporting social justice, human rights, workers' rights, etc. So that's that's part of our tradition. So um, it's really. I think imperative that we say we will no longer accept that these things be done in our name and reclaim our tradition and our religion. Uh, and I think you make a very good point that Zionism and Judaism are not the same. Um, that Zionism is a political ideology that has, that has resulted in many of the things that we've just been discussing and more. So um, reclaiming what it means to be a Jew, reclaiming our history of social justice activism, I think is something um, that really is important for Jews t to recognize and to do. And I think one of the beautiful things that I've found as I've gotten involved in Jewish Voice for Peace is that there are such strong alliances with other communities. You know, in the last year, or I guess in the last couple of years, the uh, Presbyterian Church the, uh, has adopted BDS, and the Methodist Church has just uh, 
divested from Israeli banks and their pension funds. Uh, there are a number of Muslim groups. There are a number of Christian peace groups who are all working on this. Because to change American public opinion, we need broad coalitions. Yes, we as Jews need to stand up and say that there is more than one voice in the Jewish community. But we also have to unite others. Of course. So, since you both are active in the BDS movement, I just wanted you to tell our um, our listeners a little bit more about how to know exactly what products they can or cannot boycott. And um, I find it particularly difficult when, um, you know, in a grocery store or something. Now people are becoming very careful about actually not writing that it was produced in Israel. So it's very hard to know exactly. Like, if you look on Sabra Hummus, a lot of the time it won't say made in Israel, but you kind of have to just recognize the brands. What's a good strategy that you think people can take so that they can be more conscious um, consumers? Um, one resource that I would recommend is a website called whoprofits.org. Um, and it's... Um, essentially a research organization as well as that's affiliated with the social justice movement in Israel that documents um, the various business ties that uh, that companies have to the Israeli occupation. So um, if you're looking to find out more information about what sort of products to boycott, that's one place to go. But also I think... Um, in the BDS movement, we, when we choose boycott targets, we try to be very strategic in our, ch in our choices so that, um, the movement can broaden in terms of a coalition. Uh, per, for example, the company G4S, it's a, a security company that provides services to prisons, uh, both in Israel and in this country. And there have been successful campaigns to uh, boycott G4S, not only for its complicity in the occupation and the repression of Palestinians, but uh, because of the horrible role that it plays in the prison industrial complex in this country, especially in communities of color. So um, whoprofits.org um, for both consumer boycotts as well as a more strategic look at, at boycott targets. And um you know, it's very interesting because you mentioned the issue of Sabra Hummus. Under U.S. Customs regulations, products made in the settlements or in Gaza, or outside the Green Line must be labeled as such. You cannot legally in the U.S. label something made in Israel if it's, na if it's made in the settlements. But our Customs Department has not enforced those rules. Uh, they recently put out a notice saying they were going to enforce them, but they haven't done so. And just yesterday, a Republican in the Senate, I'm sorry, I forget who, I don't know if you remember. Uh, wasn't it Rubio? No, I don't think it was Rubio. I think it was one of the others. But introduced a law directing the Customs Department to label things made in the settlements as made in Israel. And so if that goes anywhere in Congress, we're going to need all of you to call and write and demand that they not pass that. Yeah, my friend and I were actually at a restaurant in um, New York. And I don't know, when we walked in, I think I was I was a little bit skeptical that maybe it was Israeli because they had on the menu like Israeli couscous or something. And so I said, oh, are you guys Israeli? And the guy's like, no, no, no. No, no, we're Greek. We're Greek. Like, no. And I think people are scared because, you know, a lot more people know now. And so it's like people want to disassociate themselves with Israel, which I feel like maybe is a first step. So. Well, and, you know, there's been a lot of research in the last six or eight months mm -hmm. that public opinion in the U.S. is changing. Mm -hmm. um, in a recent survey, 46% of Democrats said that they favor some form of pressure on Israel to end the occupation. And in a different survey, about 45% of Republicans said that the U.S. should not favor Israel in our international relations. So, you know, there is change happening, and we have to nurture it and continue it. And um, 
in our Freedom to Boycott in Maryland campaign, that's something that we've actually emphasized with our state representatives, that public opinion is shifting. And um, if they want to be viable for uh, particularly young voters um, in the future, and particularly Democrats, but not solely Democrats, that they need to really heed the writing on the wall, that this again, the narrative has changed, people's opinions have changed, um, and it's it's movements like Freedom to Boycott in Maryland, uh, and as well as many others that are responsible for, for part of that change. I know you were talking a little bit about some of the candidates, presidential candidates, and I know just as members involved in the, in the Palestinian activist community, you kind of just accept that no one, no major candidate is going to be in support of Palestinian rights, really. And you see Bernie Sanders, for instance, who has a much more liberal rhetoric on economic issues and everything, but then once he hits foreign policy, it seems to be a huge shift and there's support of Israel there. So do you think that there's, that we should just accept that more generally, that that's not really a fight at this point that um, the Palestinian activist community should deal with? Um, is it worth you know, really making it apparent to presidential candidates that Palestine is an important issue and that it needs to be addressed and it shouldn't just be this given that, okay, anybody running for president is obviously going to support Israel. Well, let me say what the lawyers require me to say <laughs> first, which is that Jewish Voice for Peace is a nonprofit. And so we do not endorse or comment on individual candidates. Oh, okay. However... We are happy to comment on the issues. And we think that this is an issue that we should be bringing up. Um, Jewish Voice for Peace has recently expanded our efforts in Congress to educate Congress and the government on Israel and Palestine from our perspective. And we've had uh, about 75 meetings with members of Congress over the last year. And we'll have many more in 2016. And uh, we have actually done outreach to every presidential campaign because that's one of the things the law says when you're a nonprofit. You can talk issues with candidates if you do it with all candidates. So we, we, we're not saying we'll talk to A and not B. And we have reached out to all the campaigns and asked to meet with them, with their foreign policy staffs, to give our perspective of Israel and Palestine. And I urge everyone, regardless of, you know, Palestinian, Jewish, Christian, to, to join with us and with other groups to reach out. Because, uh, you know, we just started getting involved in the freedom to boycott activity in Virginia. And we, when we talk to some of our Virginia delegates, they say, you know, I get tremendous amount of calls and emails from the, quote, Jewish community, not counting us, of course, but I don't hear anything from the other side. And so as the other side, it's our obligation to be more active. And we need to work. We're starting to partner with various groups. Uh, American Muslims for Palestine has recently set up an office in D.C. and is working with us. In Virginia, we're working with the New Dominion PAC, which is an Arab-American PAC in Virginia that has done a lot of work on civil rights and equality that's now joining with us, or we're joining with them, to, to spread this message. And um, Ms. Glick, I wanted to ask you as well, because you mentioned this, that similar organizations that are um, profiting off of uh, the prison industrial complex are also present in, in prisons in Palestine as well. And I know that Jewish Voice for Peace just recently um, created a petition to support um, against the apartheid wall, but also aligned with uh, gentrification as well. Uh, if you could talk a or I'm, I'm not sure if that's what it is, but if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you see maybe as linking other struggles, particularly the African-American struggle and um, now with the Black Lives Matter movement, how um, linking the Palestinian struggle as an issue that is really a social injustice that has commonalities amongst other struggles, how will that be helpful? 
Sure. Um, I think the campaign that you're referring to is against Airbnb because oh, yeah. um, Airbnb is uh, now allowing settlers in these illegal settlements in the West Bank to put their homes, apartments, uh, rooms in their homes on Airbnb um, to list them for people, for vacationers to, to use while they're on vacation. In fact, it's funny that you mentioned it because just last night I went on Airbnb's website and did a search and in fact found several, um, vacancies, uh, for, uh, for places to stay in the West Bank. So, um, and also Airbnb is, I think it's one of those, um, one of those services, if you will, that often um, are kind of a, a foothold in uh, in neighborhoods that are being gentrified. So linking the gentrification process in this country that often happens in poor communities and also communities of color to the expropriation of land of Palestinian land is one way that those um, that those overlaps occur, um, and the the examples that you gave and the ones that I spoke about earlier, I think are are very um, are very obvious ones. Really, I think the prison industrial complex, um, as well as uh, the walls that are being built uh, on the southern on our southern borders in the United States have very similar purposes. Uh, the profit motive is there for these corporations who build them. Um, similar to what is happening in Palestine, the so-called uh, separation barrier, apartheid wall, whatever you want to call it, is there to take land, um, to fence in communities, to f- either force them to leave or in some way pacify them. So it's a very similar process uh, that I think is deserving a very similar response. You know, I think that what we are seeing, and probably a lesson we we've always known, is that among politicians, the more progressive politicians are going to support human rights in all its forms, uh, or almost all its forms. And so, when we're educating them about Black Lives Matter, when we're educating them about Islamophobia, these are the people who are the most open. And unfortunately, what we have in many cases in America is what we've come to call PEP, or PEP, which is Progressive Except Palestine. Mm. And so on the congressional work we're doing at JVP, a lot of our initial outreach has been to the progressive caucuses in Congress and probably coming soon at the state level because we can sit down with them and say, you know, this is what Black Lives Matter is saying. And they'll say, oh, yeah, we have to deal with that. And then we can say, well, how is that different than how Palestinians are treated? And suddenly, you know, they, they realize, you know, they can, they can be educated. Mm-hmm. And so what we have to do, I think, is work together with other progressive groups to, agre- to elect progressive leaders and then educate them better uh, on our issues, on all of our issues. So do you think the um, black community is an important place to start given the climate of U.S. race relations at this time and the police brutality against African Americans? Because I know um, when what was happening in Ferguson that Palestinians, there were many, uh, there was much interaction between Palestinians on the ground in Palestine with activists in Ferguson as well, kind of trying to create connections amongst them. And also, there is a strong Zionist lobby that is trying to promote African Americans kind of to be their little tokens to talk about, you know, a, in, in favor of Zionism. So do you think there's an active, um, reason why the Zionist lobby wants to kind of claim the African-American struggle as being aligned with the Zionist struggle? Um, Well, I think we're all very cognizant of um, the success of the civil rights movement in this country. And that movement has come to be... um, 
to be celebrated as it should and that it's it presents again a very powerful narrative of people coming together to non-violent non-violently um call for and achieve a certain level of change. So I think that um you know the forces who oppose groups like Jewish Voice for Peace recognize uh how that resonates with all Americans or vir- I shouldn't say all Americans but for many many Americans. It's a very mainstream concept that the civil rights movement in this country was something that we should celebrate. So um and of course it was led by by black americans by african african american leaders and and communities so for them to essentially align themselves with that history gives them a power and a moral force in this country um that frankly i think they don't deserve because if you scratch underneath the surface and you look at um what what these mainstream jewish uh groups represent and um the forces that they're aligned with you see something very very different one concrete example i'll give you is something that that was brought to the surface again during the ferguson demonstrations is that thousands thousands of police officers and security officials have been trained in Israel by Israeli military police and security forces in tactics that they use against the Palestinians and that you see them use in places like Ferguson they also use them against the occupy movement um they there's a a group called the uh Jewish I'm got it's just na j i s n a Jewish intelligence security i i can't remember the what no, the act neither. what the acronym stands for but google just na j i s n a and you'll see that um actively recruits and funds um in this country and in, including Washington DC, Baltimore and surrounding states uh the training of our police and security services in these tactics so the connection can't get any starker than that and the consequences as well I think aren't any can't be any starker. I think also um it's important to look at the fact that some of Israel's strongest support in the US is coming from the evangelical community which is mostly white but they provide tremendous political support for Israel and uh, millions and millions of dollars. and APAC and other groups have chosen to align with them which is very scary when you think about it because what they will tell you is the reason they support zionism is they're looking for armageddon and you know waiting for the end of the world but it's become a natural almost line extension for the, for APAC to say gee all these evangelicals are supporting us many african americans are deeply religious so it's easy to make the tie and reach out to them and somehow they hope that they can literally buy them off so that they'll ignore what's happening to the palestinians so just in closing if you can give our our listeners a little bit more information about how they can get involved potentially with BDS or um or the um the coalition you spoke of the freedom to boycott in Maryland coalition and what we can do what our part can be in this um movement Sure. Well, the Freedom to Boycott in Maryland Coalition um is having this Monday, February 8th, a lobby night in Annapolis from 5 to 9 p.m. where Marylanders are have made appointments uh with our representatives to lobby against any anti-BDS bill uh that might be introduced in the General Assembly. And I would urge your listeners to go to our website which is freedomtoboycott.com. and that's freedom number 2 boycott.com to find out more information about our lobby night we also have a very easy one or two click way for you to send letters to your Maryland state representatives um and lots of other information not only on BDS um but also uh the campaign that's been ongoing and so far very successful Well and uh anyone who's interested in Jewish Voice for Peace uh this can go to jvp.org 
and that will get them if they're interested on our national email list and there's a button on there for local chapters which they can click on to be in touch with our DC metro chapter uh, in Virginia if, uh, for listeners in Virginia we desperately need you um, we lost a vote yesterday in the House of Delegates on a resolution condemning BDS. Uh, however, there were 11 brave delegates who stood up to APAC and did not vote for the bill, which we're very proud of. Uh, but that will be coming up in the Virginia Senate in a few weeks. There's also a bill which we believe to be unconstitutional, which says that the that anybody doing business with the state of Virginia has to sign a statement that they do not support boycotting Israel. Uh, there's going to be a hearing on that tomorrow, and uh, so we really need Virginians. Uh, we're, we just got started late because these got sort of snuck in, so we don't have a website yet, but we will have a Facebook page up in the next day or two, and uh, we'll be uh, looking for all the support we can get. Thank you so much both for joining us and thank you for all the great work that you do and I hope to have you back soon. For those of you who are just tuning in, we've been talking about the boycott divestment sanction movement and the current legislative efforts to make it illegal. Um, we're going to move to a musical break and thank you and have a good day. <laughs> 